This video will discuss post hartree fock methods, which are quantum mechanical methods for atoms and molecules which go beyond the hartree fock approximation. So to start off, we'll define the correlation energy. The correlation energy of an atom or a molecule equals the exact quantum mechanical energy of it minus the hartree fock energy of the atom. So correlation is the difference between the exact energy and the hartree fock energy. So two factors affect the accuracy of any hartree fock calculation. Number one is the size of the atomic orbital basis set that we use. So how many basis functions, what kind of basis functions, those types of things. The other thing that determines the accuracy of our electronic structure calculation is the accuracy of the electron repulsion method used. So the rest of this video is going to discuss these two approximations, different, different choices of atomic orbital basis set, and different electron repulsion methods. There's going to be a lot of acronyms and a lot of stuff you're not going to be familiar with here, but just focus on the general message and some of the take-home points here, rather than the minute details and all the names and acronyms of all these methods. All right, so first is approximation is the size of the atomic orbital basis set. This is, this is true in Hartree-Fock as it is for any of these other methods. So first is the zeta level. This is the number of atomic orbital basis functions you use for each angular momentum shell for your atoms. So for example, something that would be uh, double zeta would include, say, two sets of s functions, or two sets of p functions, two sets of d functions, etc., depending on what particular uh, shell you're talking about. <clears throat> so typically, as you include a higher zeta level, if you go from double zeta to triple zeta, your basis set is getting larger, it's getting more complete, and it's approaching closer to what we call the complete basis set. So the complete basis set is a basis set which has an infinite number of basis functions and has zero error related to point number one that the atomic orbital basis set is effectively infinite in size and there is zero error due to that. All right, a second factor to, con to be aware of in uh, your atomic orbital basis set is polarization functions. So these are if you have values of higher angular momentum functions. So for example, for hydrogen atoms, the ground state occupation is just the 1s orbital. So for polarization functions, you would include p functions for hydrogen. That would allow it to respond to the left or to the right in response to some kind of environmental perturbation. So for hydrogens, <clears throat> a p function would be polarization. A d function would also be polarization. Anything higher than an s function would be a polarization function. For things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, polarization would be something like a d function or an f function. In their valence shell, they have s's and p orbitals, so to get polarization of a p orbital, you need at least a d orbital. Next up would be diffuse functions, so things where our, <clears throat> things where our exponent in our atomic orbitals is very small which makes our basis function very large and very spread out. So a diffuse function would help to capture any effects that are happening far away from the atom. Diffuse functions being things that are very large, very spread out. And finally, there's the type of function that you're interested in. These are generally fall into two main categories called either Popel sets or Dunning sets. So Popel sets have names like STO3G, 321G, 631G star, whereas the Dunning type sets have names like CCPVDZ, augmented CCPVDZ, augmented CCPVTZ, etc. So <clears throat> for Popel sets, you're typically having things where you're mentioning how many atomic orbitals are used at each, at each zeta, so 3 or 2, 1. So 631G star uses six atomic orbitals for your cores, and then double zeta for your valence, three orbitals combined for one level and one for another. So 631G star is double zeta, 321G is double zeta, STO3G would be single zeta. Um, stars in Popel functions indicate polarization, and for diffuse functions, 
in Dunning, in Dunning functions, having augmented or AUG in front indicates diff having diffuse functions. For Popel sets, having a plus in front of the G indicates diffuse functions. And then for Dunning sets, um, this D or T indicates the zeta level, so double zeta, triple zeta, quadruple zeta, etc. And the uh, the letters in there stand for augmented, correlation consistent, polarized valence, double zeta. So correlation consistent, polarized valence, double zeta for the lowest set there. But that's getting into a lot more details there. Going over to number two, the accuracy of the electron repulsion method used. So Hartree-Fock is one method for electron repulsion. Hartree-Fock treats electron repulsion as the is each electron feeling the average density of all the other electrons. Alternatively, you can have things called density functional theory, or mahler plesset perturbation theory, coupled cluster theory, or configuration interaction. So density functional theory, or DFT, is, is another method that has a different way of treating the exchange energy of your atoms and the correlation of them. So where we used exchange integrals in Hartree-Fock, DFT is going to use some different kind of function for that exchange part. Uh, the, the Coulomb integrals are basically work the same as do the one electron integrals, but how they handle exchange and correlation is very different. So these will often be acronyms that you'll see like B3LYP, B97, PBE, MO5-2X. They're usually some kind of acronym, which is usually an acronym of the names of the people who made it, like Becky, Li Yang Par, Purdue, uh, etc., or Minnesota, and sometimes maybe the year of what, when they were made, 1997, 2005. B3LIP has three parameters in there. So there's a hodgepodge of naming schemes for DFT, but it's close to, to Hartree-Fock in that it's a self-consistent field method, but it handles exchange differently. Mahler plesset perturbation theory is a perturbation theory which acts on top of Hartree-Fock. So the most common MP, MP method would be MP2, second order perturbation theory, which is a second order perturbation theory for correlation energy, which is the electrons not feeling each other as average smeared out charge densities, but feeling each other more explicitly. So if you do that to second order, you get a much better answer than Hartree-Fock. Typically, you don't go up to orders beyond MP2 because they get very uh, computationally demanding, and instead you would use something like coupled cluster theory. But yes, MP3, MP4, MP5, they all exist. So coupled cluster theory is something that looks like, well, let's discuss configuration interaction first. Configuration interaction takes the Hartree-Fock ground state so let's say we have a beryllium atom here with orbitals in our ground state, and then we have virtual atoms. So we can excite uh, we can excite electrons into higher energy determinants like these. So single excitation bring up one electron, double excitation excite two electrons, triple, quadruple, etc. So these are all excited determinants, and they actually contribute a non-zero amount to your total wave function. So in configuration interaction, you do a variational method where you include a coefficient where you include these excited determinants in addition to your ground state determinant. Now Hartree-Fock is going to get 99% of the interaction in, of the total energy correct, but a lot of chemistry happens in that last 1% in these excited determinants. So configuration interaction does a variational method where they get what coefficients we should use for these excited determinants to get this correlation energy where our electrons are interacting explicitly with each other instead of in their average charge densities. Things like CI doubles, or CI singles, CI singles and doubles, CI singles, doubles, and perturbative triples, depending on how many excited determinants they use. If you excite the electrons all the way up to the total number of electrons, then you're using what's called full CI, which is actually the exact uh, the exact solution to this problem. So the the exact energy here is actually the full CI energy in a complete basis set. Finally, coupled cluster theory is like CI, you're doing excited state determinants, but they do this kind of Taylor series expansion where you get the product of a lot of these higher order excitations 
but you're only doing some of the lower order ones. Like you'll approximate a quadruple excitation as a product of two double excitations. So these have acronyms like couple cluster singles and doubles, couple cluster singles, doubles, triples, singles, doubles, and perturbative triples, singles, doubles, triples, quadruples, etc. So this all forms kind of a hierarchy here in a two-dimensional plane. So these two approximations, uh, as I said, are, affect one another. So you're going all the way from hartree fock up to full CI in terms of the accuracy of your electron repulsion method, going from a minimal basis set called like STO, STO3G up to a complete basis set in your basis set size. And the exact answer is full CI in a complete basis. But that's impossible to get because full CI scales factorially or exponentially with the number of basis functions and the complete basis fun set is an infinite number of them. So infinity factorial is a very large number and we can't actually compute that number. Sometimes for things up to a dozen atoms or so you can get a couple cluster with singles, doubles, and perturbative triples in a large triple zeta basis set. And that's generally a quantitatively very accurate answer. What's more routine for atoms of up to a few hundred would be using something like second order Mahler Plessit perturbation theory, MP2, which in a double zeta basis set would give you something that's qualitatively pretty good. The minimum possible calculation you could do would be to do hartree fock in some minimal basis set like STO3G, where you don't have any unoccupied orbitals beyond your valence level. Uh, density functional theory on this graph, it doesn't really fall in kind of necessarily anywhere. Each approximation is different and some are very good, some are very bad. So somewhere between hartree fock and CCSD is typically where they fall, although there are certainly bad ones that are even worse than hartree fock So that is the basics of post hartree fock methods. Your two concerns are the size of your basis set, what your basis set looks like, and the accuracy of the method you can use. That's all limited based off the number of atoms you have and the number of basis functions you need as for what you have com computational time and the software to be able to do, getting you close as close to the exact answer as you want to go with the CPU time available to you.